Dead America, Heartland, Part 3, Dead America, The Second Week, Book 5, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1, Day 0 plus 11. The landscape was vacant beneath the midday sun, the Missouri River flowing along the east side of the chugging train into a large reservoir. Bill focused hard on the tracks, plugging at a brisk pace, but keeping a keen eye out for anything out of the ordinary. Even in the middle of nowhere, they had to stay vigilant. Something could pop up at any moment. Can somebody explain to me why we're trying to get up to Seattle instead of just settling down here? Private Johnson asked from the window, waving a hand at the beautiful scenery. Look at this, ain't nothing for days. Sergeant Kersey didn't look up from the map he was holding. Because the U.S. military is a thirsty beast that requires all manner of resources, most notably oil, he explained flatly. And not only are the Canadian oil fields within reach, but Washington State has the fifth highest refinery capacity of any state in the Union. Interesting, Johnson replied, stroking his chin. But how in the hell did you know that random-ass factoid? Kersey shrugged, still staring at the map because General Stevens told me that when I suggested the exact same thing you just did. Great minds, huh? Johnson chuckled. The sergeant shrugged. Yeah, something like that. The soldiers pitched forward as Bill hit the brakes on the train. God damn it, Johnson cried as he fell down onto one knee. What is it now? Bill motioned out the window. Pickup truck on the tracks, he replied. Kersey folded up his map and they surveyed the cluster of houses on the west side of the tracks. To the east were three nondescript buildings. Are you fucking kidding me? Johnson threw his hands up. There's like 20 people in this fucking town. How does a truck end up on the tracks? Bill shrugged. Not sure, but we still gotta take care of it. Probably for the best, Kersey replied. We're getting really close to Helena. Might do us a bit of good to regroup before hitting that. The engineer nodded. Probably a good call, as it's the fifth largest city in the state. What, did General Stevens tell you that one too? Johnson groaned as he brushed himself off. Bill smirked. Nope, I just paid attention in college. Kersey barked a laugh as the train came to a full screeching stop. The three men clambered down from the engine car, and the first box car opened, revealing the rest of their team. Private Kowalski jumped down first, rubbing his squinting eyes in the bright sun. Damn, Bill, any chance you can get a slow rolling stop next time, he moaned. I was firmly in dreamland, then the next thing I know Baker and Mason were laying on top of me. Sorry about that, Bill replied, hooking his thumbs into his belt loops. I figured we were fine out here in the middle of nowhere, but it appears as though I was mistaken. How big's the job? Private Baker asked as he stretched his arms above his head. Kersey motioned to the front of the train. Single pickup truck on the tracks. Ah, well, I'm going back to bed then, Baker replied. The sergeant shook his head. You might as well stay up. We're getting close to Helena and need a game plan. Fifth largest city in the state, Johnson declared proudly. Private Mason raised an eyebrow in confusion. Good, good to know there, Johnson. Bill chuckled and shook his head at Johnson's wide grin enjoying the look of glee on the private's face at looking smart in front of his comrades. He patted him on the shoulder as they began to walk towards the truck. Mason, Johnson, make sure that truck is clear, Kersey instructed. The soldiers raised their weapons, keeping guard even in such a tiny town. They did a quick sweep around the vehicle, but found nothing suspicious. We're good, Johnson said, and reached in to pop the gear shift into neutral. It didn't take much effort for them to push the truck up over the tracks, and it rolled easily into the grass off to the side. So, what's next? Mason asked. Kersey lowered his gun. We need to talk about Helena. Corporal Bretz cleared his throat, rubbing the last of the sleep from his eyes. Sergeant, if I might make a suggestion first. What is it? Kersey asked, turning to him. Bretz pointed to one of the three buildings across the street, boasting B-A-R in big block letters. I think we should stock up on some <clears throat> vital supplies before discussing our next impossible task. The sergeant grinned. Two drink maximum, boys. We'll get the rest to go. 
The soldiers whooped as they headed across the street in a pack, guns at the ready to breach the door to the happiest building in town. Kowalski and Bretz took up position on either side, the former giving a nod before turning the handle and throwing it open. The corporal rushed in first, swinging his gun around the dim space. It looked to be in fairly good condition despite the apocalypse, and only a single figure moaned and jerked behind the bar. Bretz pulled out his flashlight and shone it in the direction of the undead bartender, who was missing the bottom of his jaw, tongue dangling down its neck. Clear the back rooms, the corporal instructed. I'll handle this guy. Kowalski nodded. On it. He jogged off as Bretz casually approached the bar. He sat down on a stool, peering behind into the small space. The zombie staggered over, gargling all the way, and the corporal pulled out his knife, stabbing into the creature's forehead without even standing up. That's the problem with these small town bars, Brett said, shaking his head. It's almost impossible to find quality help. We're clear back there, Kowalski announced as he came back in from the rear room. Kersey led the rest of the soldiers inside. Baker, Mason, see what you can do about getting us some light in here. Johnson, why don't you set us up something to drink? Coming right up, sir, Johnson replied with a grin and hopped over the bar. He kicked aside the corpse and got to work, setting up a line of glasses and pouring a double shot of whiskey for each of his comrades. He held up his own glass, prompting everyone to do the same. To the best damn group of rail riders I've ever known, he declared. There was a smattering of hell yes and damn straights, and Bill let out a laugh. Well, you guys haven't gotten me killed yet, he said. So yeah, y'all are the best in my book as well. Everyone clinked their glasses together and took sips of their drinks, relishing in the delightful burn of the alcohol so long denied them. Bill, can you join Bretz and I over here? Kersey asked, waving him to a table in the center of the room. We could use your expertise. Sure thing, the engineer replied, leaving the others to cheers a second time. Remember, two drink maximum, the sergeant said firmly, pointing at the privates. I don't want to end up getting shot because one of y'all is drunk shooting. I'll keep him in line, Sarge, Kowalski said with a wink. Kersey shook his head with a chuckle. I'm sure you will. He turned to the table and sat down next to Bretz, who laid out a road map of the area. Bill, what do we know about the tracks in Helena? The corporal asked as he drew his finger along the rail line. There's a small yard there, I think maybe five, six tracks worth, Bill replied, leaning forward on his elbows to look at the map. With any luck, it'll be empty and we can just roll right through. And if it's not, Kersey asked. The engineer clasped his hands together and took a deep breath. We may want to consider abandoning this train and finding something at the other end of the yard. Kind of defeats the purpose of clearing a path, doesn't it? Bretz raised an eyebrow. The sergeant puffed out his cheeks and then cocked his head. Well, there's seven of us, including Bill, and I doubt we have more than a hundred rounds left between us. We haven't been through any town this big yet, and it's not going to take much for us to get overwhelmed. I'm not sure the general is going to be particularly happy with it, Bretz replied, and then shook his head, raising his glass. But fuck it, he isn't here. Kersey laughed. Cheers to that. Chapter Two Bill slowed significantly about two miles from the city. He and the soldiers were on high alert, ready to stop at a moment's notice. Mason and Baker stood on the outer railing while the rest of the team were packed inside the engine car. What in the holy hell? Johnson breathed as they came around the bend towards the city. There were piles and piles of dead bodies on either side of the tracks. Bill eased the train to a stop. Didn't expect to see this, Brett said, taking in the walls of rotted flesh. Sarge, what do you think? It's like someone is making a mass grave, Kersey replied, motioning to the excavation equipment off to one side. Johnson blinked a few times. There's gotta be what, a few thousand bodies there? Easily, Bill replied, and stifled a gag as the scent permeated the cabin. Judging by the smell, I'd peg it even higher than that. Kersey clenched his jaw. Let's keep moving. We need to see what's going on in Helena. The engineer nodded and eased the throttle forward, inching them forward into the city. 
As the skyline came into view, the soldiers leaned forward in confusion. Sarge, are those lights? Bratz asked, eyes widening. Kersey pulled out his binoculars, stepping right against the window to peer at one of the buildings several hundred yards ahead. Even in the late afternoon sun, it was clear there were floodlights on. Unless I'm going blind, he replied. Those are indeed lights. Bill slowed to a gentle stop again, staying short of a makeshift barricade blocking the tracks. Somebody had put up a fence, and it extended on either side of the tracks in either direction. A trio of pickup trucks approached up the railroad, and Kersey stepped out of the cab to join Baker and Mason on the front, weapons at the ready. Lower your guns, the sergeant said, but keep them ready. Given that pile of bodies we just passed, whoever is in charge of this town has some firepower. Might be a good idea to get on their good side. The truck stopped on the other side of the fence in a V formation, and a short, fit, white man with black hair jumped out of the front vehicle. He strolled up to the barricade, as casual as if it were a normal summer day. Well, howdy, he greeted, hooking his thumbs into the pockets of his jeans. If I had to venture a guess, I'd say y'all aren't from around these parts. Kersey chuckled. What gave us away? Not to insult your sneaking ability, but riding into town on a big old train is a dead giveaway. The man replied with a toothy grin. Plus, as much as I hate to admit it, tourism has been a bit down the last few weeks. In fact, nobody has come through here in quite some time, so anybody new is gonna be raising my suspicion. The sergeant spread his palms slowly. Well, if you'll have us, I have a few boys here who could use some quality R&R. Definitely a possibility, the man said and cocked his head. But first, why don't you tell me who y'all are and what y'all are doing here? My name is Sergeant Kersey, U.S. Military, Kersey explained. I have a team of five, plus my civilian train engineer, and we are clearing a path to the northwest so the bulk of our men in the Midwest can make their way up there. The man raised his chin thoughtfully, shifting his weight to one hip. The Northwest, huh? Something big going down? That's the current rumor, the sergeant replied, with what he hoped looked like a noncommittal shrug. All right, good enough for me, the man replied, and gave a thumbs up to the trucks behind him. Why don't you boys lock up your train and your rifles, and I'll take you to meet Mayor Hogan. Kersey took a deep breath. You don't honestly expect us to go with you unarmed, do you? Not at all, the man said with a shake of his head. Sidearms are just fine. In these difficult times, we're trying our best to live in town the way it was before all this. And frankly, having a group of army men walking around with assault rifles isn't the best way to be achieving that. The sergeant nodded. Fair enough, we'll be right down. He stepped back into the cab, followed by the privates outside. Leave the rifles in the cab, sidearms only. That's leaving us awfully light, Bretz replied, pursing his lips. Kersey shrugged. Not like we really have the ammo for them anyway. This is true, the corporal agreed bitterly and unslung the large gun from his shoulder. All right, everybody on their best behavior, Kersey said firmly, looking each man in the eye in turn. Bill, no matter what happens, you're with me, always. We clear? Bill nodded. Yep. Okay, the sergeant said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Let's go check out the mysteries of Helena. Chapter Three Kersey and Kowalski rode in the back seat of the main man's truck. Bill nestled comfortably between them. The dark haired man, whose name had turned out to be Seth, drove across the outskirts of town and then onto the road and into the heart of it, his companion in the passenger seat, stoic all the way. The soldiers gawked at the stores along the street, fully lit up with power, the town almost looking normal. Kowalski did a double take at the sight of a man at the grocery store, helping an older lady load up paper bags into her car. I have so many questions, he blurted. In due time, sir, Seth replied with a chuckle. Mayor Hogan will gladly answer all of your questions. But I'm just, how? Kowalski stammered. It doesn't look like anything has even happened here. It's like the apocalypse jumped over top of you. Seth took a deep breath. As I'm sure you noticed when you rolled in, the apocalypse most certainly did not skip us over. I'm, I'm sorry, Kowalski's face drained of all color. I'm truly sorry for saying that. I really didn't think before I spoke. 
It's all right, their host replied. I know you didn't mean any harm, and I can only imagine what y'all have seen out there. We only got a brief glimpse of it before the TV went dark. I can see how our town is a bit of a shock to you. Bill let out a low whistle between his teeth. That's an understatement. Look, I know that Mayor Hogan is going to explain everything to us. Kowalski leaned forward, eyes wide. But I just gotta know, how in the world do you have power? Seth nodded in defeat as they turned a corner. Since I'm the one who headed up the project, I can answer that one, he said. The Canyon Ferry Dam is just up the way on the Missouri River and is a prime source of hydroelectricity. Once we got the town secure, I led a team up there, and we were able to get everything stabilized and running smoothly. We have to ration the power a bit since it's not at full capacity, but based on your reaction to it, I'm going to assume we're doing better than most other places. Kersey shook his head slowly. This town is certainly a marvel. You should be very proud. We are, sir, Seth replied firmly. We are. The trio of trucks pulled up to the old courthouse. It was two stories and built of stone, easily a heritage building in the city. Come on, Seth said as he put the vehicle in park. I'll take you to Mayor Hogan. It was quick for Kersey's team to mobilize, following Seth inside, as they were all burning with questions about this interesting town. Their dark-haired host led the way across the marble floors of the courthouse. People scurried about here and there, and it was surreal to see such a flurry of normal-looking activity underneath the tungsten glow of light bulbs. Oh, Seth, you're looking good today, a little old lady said as she approached the group. You and your wife need to come by so I can cook you a proper dinner. He grinned fondly at her. We would be honored, Miss Lindsay. Oh, that's so good to hear, she exclaimed, clasping her hands together. And your new friends are invited, too. Been a good while since I've had a mess of hungry boys to cook for. The soldiers smiled at her enthusiasm and waved to her with a chorus of ma'ams as she wandered past. She seems nice, Johnson said as they continued their walk. Reminds me of my Mima. Seth chuckled. She cooks a mean meatloaf, too. Sarge, just to let you know, Johnson declared. I may go AWOL if we're not here for that. Kersey laughed. You and me both. They headed up a flight of stairs to the second floor offices, and Seth opened the door to a large conference room. There was a massive oval table, and on the far end, an oak desk, where a middle-aged man stood up from his chair. Come on in he invited and gave his thick white mustache a swipe as he approached the group. Seth, my boy, how are you? The dark-haired man smiled. I'm doing well, Mayor, and you? Oh, you know, just another day in the apocalypse, Mayor Hogan replied. He surveyed the group of soldiers and clasped his hands in front of him. These must be the military boys I heard about over the radio. Kersey stepped forward. Yes, sir. Oh, don't call me sir, Hogan replied with a wave of his hand. Way too formal. Mayor is just fine. The sergeant nodded. All right, Mayor, he replied. I'm Sergeant Kersey, and these are my men. He introduced everyone in turn, and Hogan went down the line, shaking everyone's hand with a surprisingly firm grip. Welcome to our little slice of heaven, he said when he was finished, motioning for everyone to sit at the large table. And given the look on your faces, y'all look as confused as a chicken in a whorehouse. So what would you like to know? Kersey took a seat and swiveled towards the white-haired man. For starters, how did you manage to secure a city this size? We had a crazy amount of luck, Mayor Hogan admitted. The day all of this started spreading, we had a fierce pop-up thunderstorm. Lightning ran in on the control tower at the airport and blew out everything. Had to shut it completely down for a full day. So while the rest of y'all were dealing with those critters running wild, we just had a whole mess of sick folk. We got just enough national news to know what was happening, so we were able to get people quarantined. He paused, swallowing hard at the memory. It, it was difficult putting our neighbors down like animals, but just like when a dog turns rabid, you gotta do what you gotta do. Kersey nodded somberly. I think I speak for everyone in my group when I say we know how you feel, he said. We've all had to do things that will haunt us. But like you said, we gotta do what we gotta do. Thank you, Sergeant, Hogan replied. Anyway, once we were able to pacify the zombie uprising, it wasn't too difficult to do the rest. 
Seth here got us set up with power. We have several farms in the area that we were able to keep running and get set up with greenhouses. And we mostly neutralized the threat from Missoula by blocking up the interstate. Bill blanched. What's wrong with Missoula? Let me guess, that's the next stop on this trip? Bretz groaned. The engineer nodded. Yep. Missoula got hit hard, the mayor explained. We were able to evacuate a few hundred people from there, but it was a slaughterhouse. Seth drummed his fingers on the edge of the table. And unless you are finding another mode of transportation, there's another complication. Let me guess, Bill raised a hand. Tracks are blocked? With an overturned fire truck, Seth replied. Bill scrubbed his hands down his face. Jesus fucking Christ, how in the hell do you flip a goddamn fire truck? My brother works out at the airport, Seth explained. As this was going down, he was in touch with his friend at the Missoula Tower, so he got the play-by-play. They had a plane crash after the pilot turned as they were in their final descent. Somebody at the fire department who was way too dedicated to his job drove out there and got attacked. He lost control, and the next thing you know, instant train block. Kersey turned to the engineer. Can we go around Missoula? Bill rubbed his temples and sighed. There's only one path through the forest, and it runs through Missoula, he said. I mean, I suppose we could swing a couple hundred miles south and cut through Idaho, but then we'd have to go through Boise, which is considerably larger, and God only knows what kind of shit show that's gonna be. I mean, it's already going to be a shit show when we hit Spokane, but hopefully by then we can get some support from the general. Kersey took a deep breath. I don't know about you, but I'd rather face a difficult situation while knowing what I'm in for, rather than walking into something blind. Let's figure out a way to get that fire truck moved. I'm pretty sure there's some C4 left, Baker piped up. Let's just blow it off the tracks. Bill shook his head. That would most likely destroy the tracks in the process. What about a tow truck, Bratz asked. Johnson shook his head. Nah, man, we're gonna be hard pressed to find anything with the kind of horsepower that can move a fire truck. Would a dump truck work? Seth asked, and shrugged as the soldiers all turned to him. I mean, it's not like you have to worry about the well-being of the fire truck. You just need it moved, right? Johnson nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, them dump trucks got some power behind them. I think that could work. There's a landfill in the north part of town, about a mile or so from the airport, Seth explained. Should be easy enough to get to. Johnson clapped his hands together. City landfill it is. Don't say I never take you any place nice, Kersey quipped. I do have a couple of requests for you, if you wouldn't mind. Hogan cut in. The sergeant swiveled to face him. Of course, Mayor. There are still some survivors holed up in a church downtown, Hogan explained, folding his hands together on the table in front of him. We haven't been able to reach them, and they're low on food. Would it be possible for you to get them out? I think we can manage that, Kersey agreed. What else can we do for you? Despite our barricades on the interstate, we're still fearful of an exodus from Missoula, the mayor replied. Second largest city in the state, and it wouldn't take a lot of them leaving to cause us problems. I know you don't really have any control over what they do, but if you could try to lead some of them out into the forest, we would be appreciative. The sergeant nodded. We'll make as much noise as we can while leaving town, he said. Hogan raised his hands in thanks. The fact that y'all are willing to try is good enough for me. Corporal Bretz, would you please take over the planning on this raid? Kersey asked. I'm going to go radio the general and see if we can't get some reinforcements up here to help us out with Missoula. Bretz nodded. Yes, sir. Pardon me, son, but did you say reinforcements? Hogan asked. At Kersey's nod, he cocked his head. How many are we talking about? For now? Kersey shrugged. As many as they can spare. But once we finish our mission, there's going to be a couple hundred thousand that will be working their way through here and up to the northwest. The mayor clucked his tongue. Seems like you boys are planning quite the party. Something like that, the sergeant replied. Hogan leaned forward. Well, you tell the general we're here to help. Probably can't handle all 200,000 of y'all at the same time, but we'll do what we can. Thank you, Kersey said, and headed out of the office into the hallway. Chapter 4
Excuse me, Kersey said to a pair of women exiting a small office. May I use that office to make a call? One of them nodded and held the door open for him, cheeks pinking slightly, as he smiled his thanks and headed inside. Once he had privacy, he keyed in the proper frequency. Heartland Base, please respond, he said. This is Sergeant Kersey. The response was almost immediate. This is Heartland Base. We read you loud and clear, Sergeant Kersey. I have a priority alpha message for General Stevens, he declared. Please hold, I will get him for you, came the reply. Thank you, the sergeant said, and leaned against the desk behind him while he waited. Sergeant Kersey, what's your status? The general asked. General, we're in Helena, and it's unlike anything we could have predicted, Kersey gushed. The city is fully functional. It's secure, has power, it's like nothing ever happened. There was a momentary silence. How in the hell did they pull that off? Stevens finally asked. The short version is that the airport was knocked out the day the virus spread, so they had time to prepare, the sergeant explained. Better to be lucky than good, I suppose, the general replied. Kersey nodded. Without a doubt, sir. When are you and your team heading out? Stevens asked. Depends on how quickly you can get some reinforcements to me, the sergeant replied. We've run into a situation in Missoula, and it may be too much for us to handle on our own. I'm sorry, the general replied, but your orders are to push onwards. DC is breathing down my neck to get the army to the northwest for their invasion. We've had some issues with getting the caravan up and running on our end, so we're behind schedule. I'm going to have to move heaven and earth just to get you some reinforcements to raid Spokane. Kersey sighed before hitting the button again. I understand, General, and we'll figure out a way to accomplish our mission. But you are correct that we will need some help with Spokane. What kind of reinforcements can we expect? I've been able to get 1,500 men to Moorcroft as an advanced team, Stephen said. Since I know you are close to Spokane, the next shipment to Moorcroft will be supplies. Should be able to spare 1,000 men to send your way. The sergeant cocked his head. 25 zombies to every man. Sounds like a challenge. Well, it's better odds than you currently have in Missoula, so consider yourself thankful, the general replied. That I do, sir, Kersey replied sincerely. That I do. When you clear the way through Missoula, contact me, Stephen said. The sergeant glanced out the window. The sun is setting low here, sir, so we will be tackling this at first light. Understood, the general replied. Be safe. Thank you, general, Kersey replied and then turned off his radio and promptly threw it down onto the desk. Fuck my life. Chapter five. Kersey headed back into the mayor's office, where Seth was showing the soldiers where the trucks would be located on a large map. Hogan straightened. Did the general have some good news for you? Well, we should have reinforcements, the sergeant began, for when we take Spokane. We're on our own from Missoula. Kowalski scoffed. Great, so if we somehow survive tomorrow, we'll get some help. Fantastic. Can we not just wait for the Spokane group to get here? Bratz asked, brow furrowing. Kersey shook his head. DC is up his ass to get the troops moved up, he explained. We have orders to clear the tracks. Suddenly going AWOL for that meatloaf is sounding a lot more appealing, Johnson muttered, leaning back in his chair. Sergeant, is there anything we can do to help you? The mayor asked, clasping his hands in front of him. We can't really offer you men, as we're stretched thin between the farms, the power station, and the barricades, but... Kersey cocked his head. Could you spare some ammo? Absolutely, Hogan replied. Just jot down what caliber you need, and Seth will bring you a care package later in the evening to the bed and breakfast on 6th. The soldiers all perked up at the sound of that. It was Mason who raised his hand, eyes alight with excitement. Bed and breakfast? Yes, sir, Hogan replied with a grin. You boys look like you've been through the ringer since the shindig got started. Thought you could use a little R&R, &R, so I'm gonna get you set up at the best little B&B &B we've got. Y'all have got a full day tomorrow, so I figure a good night's sleep followed by coffee and bacon and eggs would be in order. Johnson locked his fingers together and waved his clasped fists at the sky, tilting his head back. Grilled meat, thank you, Jesus. Hogan chuckled. So you're a meat man, are you? Only in his private life, Kowalski smirked. 
The room erupted in laughter, even the man himself. My apologies on the phrasing there, son, Hogan amended, and reached out to clap Johnson on the back. What I mean is, are you the type of man that appreciates a perfectly seasoned and cooked slab of beef? The private's mouth practically watered at the question. Oh, yes, sir. I thought you might be, the mayor replied. Seth, once you get these boys settled in, head down to Big Bubba's and tell them to set up a table of seven. Have old Bubba send me the bill. Seth grinned and nodded. Consider it done, Mayor. Thank you so much for your hospitality, Kersey said, and extended his hand to shake. I don't know what else I can say. Nothing else is needed, Sergeant, Hogan replied, shaking his hand cordially. Now you boys enjoy your stay here in Helena, and you let old Mayor Hogan know if you need anything else. He shook everyone's hands in turn again waving them off at their thank yous, including Johnson, who was near choked up at the thought of grilled meat. Seth led the group outside and up the street, springs in their step, despite their exhaustion. The promises of good food and comfortable beds were exciting, to say the least. Man, this is something else, isn't it? Baker gaped at the open shops around them. People milled about lazily, enjoying the evening. A group of kids tossed a football around in the middle of the road, laughing and running together like they didn't have a care in the world. Kowalski nodded. Have those kids playing stickball, and this is a snapshot out of the 50s. I loved playing stickball growing up, Bill said, a wistful edge to his tone. Kowalski raised an eyebrow. Dude, I thought you were in your 20s. Yeah, but I grew up in the rural Midwest, the engineer replied. The 1950s didn't hit our town until sometime in the mid-90s. The private snorted. Just wait until you get MTV, it's gonna blow your fucking mind. You should have seen our reaction to color TV, Bill teased. After a chuckle rippled through the group, Baker took a deep breath. Y'all think we can rebuild like this, he asked. I mean, if we're successful in Seattle? Bill shrugged. I don't see why not. If a bunch of civilians in Helena, Montana can do it, I'd like to think the full force of the US government would be capable. Well, given our recent history, nation building hasn't been one of our strong suits, Kowalski quipped. Bretz glanced over his shoulder from the front of the pack. What's so funny back there? Oh, nothing, Corporal, Kowalski replied innocently. Just laughing at our collective shortcomings. We're guests here, Private, Bretz replied with mock sternness. Please keep the flashing to a minimum. Kowalski pouted. Oh, you're no fun. Well, here are your digs for the evening, Seth declared as he stopped in front of the bed and breakfast. If y'all wanna go in and take a load off for a bit, I'll go get dinner set up. Give me an hour or so and then head on over there. I'll have everything ready for you. He motioned across the street to an old building that looked like it had been there since the dawn of time. Inside the big front windows lay a family-style diner that added to the 50s feel. Thank you, Kersey said, holding out his hand to their guide. I really appreciate the hospitality, we all do. It's our pleasure, Sergeant, Seth replied. I'll see you soon. The soldiers turned towards the bed and breakfast, lingering on the street collectively for a moment. It was Johnson who broke the silence. Anybody else feel like this is too good to be true? He asked. You should stop worrying and just be thankful we have a reprieve, Mason replied, clapping him on the back. He stepped forward and they all bustled into the building, taking in the surreal sight of the happy street once more before entering the coziness inside. Chapter six. Johnson practically dove on the plate of pancakes in the middle of the breakfast table. These are mine, Kowalski, he cried. Dude, you eat any more and that belt of yours is going to commit suicide, Kowalski said with a shake of his head. The charming old lady that had brought the food wagged a finger at the soldiers. Boys, no need to fight, she declared. I've got another batch on the griddle as we speak. Johnson and Kowalski both blushed and ducked their heads, shoulders relaxing under the scolding. Bill took the opportunity to reach over and spear his fork through the whole stack, liberating the pancakes over to his plate. Whoa, what the hell, man? Johnson yelped, eyebrows shooting up to his hairline. Bill grinned as he cut a large bite of the sweet treat. What are you gonna do, court-martial me? He shoved the gigantic hunk of dough into his mouth, and the two soldiers glowered at him. 
Morning, boys, did you all sleep well? Seth asked as he strolled into the dining room. There was a series of nods and a few mumbled responses around mouthfuls of eggs and bacon. This breakfast is awesome, Johnson blurted, spitting a hunk of yellow scramble onto Brett's cheek. Sorry, Corporal. Bratz shook his head and wiped his face, simply putting a finger to his lips to shush the boisterous private. You ready to hear the plan, Seth? Kersey piped up, setting down his cutlery and leaning back with his mug of coffee. Seth nodded and took a seat. Whenever you are, Sergeant. Kersey produced his map, spreading it out over the open part of the table nearest their guide. Okay, I've been studying this map for the last couple of hours, and this is the best plan I've come up with. If anybody has questions, concerns, or a brighter idea, I'm all ears. He glanced around the table, eyes sincere, and his team nodded. Bill, you're going to give us a ride past this neighborhood on the north side of town and drop us off. There's nothing but empty fields between there and the landfill, so it should be an easy hike to get there. Mason, you are on Bill guard duty. Johnson swallowed his mouthful and raised his hand. Why not just have Bill drop us off there? because that train is going to make a hell of a lot of noise, and the last thing we want is to draw attention to the fact that we're at the landfill, Kersey explained. Baker furrowed his brow. Won't we just lead the neighborhood zombies there, though? Nope, the sergeant replied, tapping the map. Because as Bill backs his way out of town, he's going to lay on the horn to make sure they follow. Seth's eyes grew wide. Whoa, wait a minute. The last thing we want to be doing is to draw those things in our direction. Kersey raised a hand. He's going to be stopping on the bridge over the river, so none of them will get through. And I promise that once I lay out the rest of the plan, you'll understand and be good with it. He turned to Mason and cocked his head. One more thing. You boys are going to be our communication hub. We're not going to have any direct contact between the teams, because the last thing we want to do is inadvertently alert nearby zombies that lunch is here. Seth's shoulders relaxed, and he smiled as the old lady returned and set a cup of coffee in front of him and a fresh stack of pancakes in front of Johnson. He gave Bill the side eye on her way out of the room, and he chuckled, sitting back from his plate as a sign of good faith. Okay, Kersey commanded the room once again. Once we get to the landfill, we're going to break into two teams. Bratz and Johnson, you'll be heading south into town to rescue the people trapped in the church. Once secure, you'll get up to the train and hand off the truck to the civilians. Again, Bill will lay on the horn to keep the zombies occupied. A few stragglers may continue their pursuit, but it won't be anything to take care of them with your barricades. He moved his finger across the map. Kowalski, Baker, and I are going to head to the airport to figure out a way to get the fire truck off the rails. With any luck, it'll be a simple push. Kowalski took a deep breath. And if it's not? Then you'd better have an itchy trigger finger, Kersey replied, because there's gonna be a lot of zombies to kill while we figure out how to move it. Seth raised a hand. I can actually help on that one, he put in. Ammo for your assault rifles were a bit lacking, but I was able to dig up a couple hundred rounds for each of you. For my sniper friend, however, plenty of hunters in the area were more than happy to be donating some rounds, so I got you set up with about a thousand more shots. Holy fuck, Kowalski breathed. Language, the old lady snapped as she returned with a pot of coffee to refresh everyone's mugs. Kowalski blushed again, lowering his chin. Sorry, ma'am, he said. Holy fudge sickles. She nodded as she refilled his cup. That's better. You think you can do some damage with that? Seth asked. The private grinned. Without a doubt. Once we have the route clear, Bill, you're going to come pick us up, and Baker is going to set up some C4 to attract every zombie we can, Kersey continued. Then we're off towards the forest and Spokane. Anybody got any other questions? There was a collective shaking of heads, and the sergeant nodded, draining the last of his cup. All right, well hurry up and finish your breakfast. We've got a long day ahead of us. Chapter 7 Bill brought the train to a stop on the outskirts of East Missoula, about a half mile away from a large neighborhood that stretched to the north. Kersey peered through his binoculars and took a deep breath at the sight of dozens of shambling figures on yards and streets. Bretts, get the team ready to go in the boxcar, he instructed. From the looks of things, we're going to have to burst out and hit the ground running. I'll stay up here and pick our stopping point. 
Yes, sir, the corporal replied and jumped down from the cab, heading to the back. Mason, once we're clear of the train, I want you to shoot at anything on our side of the tracks that is even thinking of looking in our direction, Kersey continued. And Bill, as soon as we're clear, I want you heading back. The engineer nodded. Not a problem, Sergeant. Okay, take us to the landing spot, Kersey said. Bill inched the train forward, picking up a little bit of speed. The noise of the wheels on track drew out zombies from what seemed like every possible nook and cranny. They emerged from alleyways, bushes, behind houses. Of course, they weren't smart enough to stay away from the train and bounced off of the moving vehicle like a rubber ball off of asphalt. Kersey stepped out onto the outer railing so he could keep an eye on the terrain behind them. Hundreds of zombies flooded the tracks, and easily thrice that congregated in the neighborhood, heading their way. How much time do you need to stop this thing? The sergeant called inside the door. Speed I'm going, Bill replied. Maybe 45 seconds. Start slowing down then, Kersey instructed. We wait any longer and we might get overrun. Bill hit the brakes, the train screeching its deceleration. The sergeant lifted his radio to his lips. 40 seconds, Bretts he declared. And you boys get ready to hustle, because goddamn if we don't have a horde on our asses. Copy that, Bretts came back. Kersey bit his lip as he stared at the horde behind them. There was about a hundred yards between the train and its pursuers, but it shortened as the vehicle slowed. He shook his head and raised the radio again. Fuck it, we gotta go now, he demanded. Get out and start running. Mason, you start popping them. And Bill, lay on that horn as soon as we're clear. He slid down the ladder and dropped onto the ground, stumbling from the moving vehicle. Gotcha, Sarge, Johnson grunted, grabbing his bicep and hauling him back to his feet. Kersey's eyes widened at the sight of the veritable sea of zombies pursuing them from the horizon and quickly folded into the soldiers' formation as they fled across the dusty terrain. Brett's led the group, moving quicker than the slowing train. Mason hung out the door of the engine cab, the constant pop, pop, pop of his gun echoing before Bill set off the whistle. The wail was near deafening as he began to move it in reverse, drawing the attention of the horde. The soldiers ran as hard as they could for a few hundred yards before finally slowing, gasping for breath and leaning on their knees. Way too early in the morning for that much cardio. Kowalski huffed. Holy hell. Bretts laughed, taking in their empty surroundings. Not getting soft on me, are you? The private rolled his eyes. Well, I do have five times the ammo y'all do, he said. That shit adds up. Suck it up, the corporal replied, clapping him on the back. We still have a couple miles to the landfill. Kowalski grunted and stretched his arms above his head. A hike and a mound of garbage, he declared brightly. Life is indeed good. The soldiers headed at a significantly slower pace across the field, not a single building in sight from the neighborhood. The air was eerily silent after the deafening moans of the horde, but the train had been a sufficient distraction for the group. As they approached the landfill, Kersey motioned for everyone to take a knee beside the lone building at the entrance. There was a single metal bar, not even automated, but one that would have been lifted by whoever was manning it. Baker, Johnson, check out the inside, the sergeant instructed. See if there are any keys. They rushed the door, quickly slipping in to sweep the small front room. There were a few chairs and a messy desk with papers everywhere. Johnson kicked the only other door open, finding an empty back office. You check the desk, I'll check in here, he said and the sound of drawers opening and closing echoed as he swept the small area. On the wall, there was a metal box, and he twisted the handle, finding several sets of keys hanging inside. Hey, I got him, he called, and when his companion sidled up next to him, he shrugged. Which one's we taken? Baker shrugged back and grabbed all of them. Looks like we each get our own truck, he replied with a grin. Any luck? Bretts asked as they emerged from the building. Johnson held up three sets and jingled them. Got six sets of keys, now we just need some trucks. I think I got some, Kowalski said from the roof, peering through his scope. What about resistance, Kersey asked. 
couple of shamblers, but nothing we can't handle, the sniper replied. Apparently, this wasn't a popular destination to ride out the apocalypse. Johnson snorted. Hard to imagine why. He waved his hand back and forth in front of his nose. With that stench, yum. All right, let's move, Kersey said, and Kowalski jumped back down to the ground. The group moved out at a deliberate pace, guns at the ready regardless of the quiet. Any idea how to tell what keys go to what truck, Baker asked, as he patted his pocket to make sure his three were secure. Johnson shrugged. Well, they got numbers on the keychain, so one can only hope. They rounded a corner of garbage to find six old-style dump trucks, each with an open top and an empty sticky back bucket. Each one had a bright yellow number on the side, and Johnson grinned, motioning to the closest one with a flourish. Johnson, Baker, find us two trucks and make sure they have plenty of fuel, Kersey said. Bretz, you and Kowalski take care of our friends over there. The sniper and his companion headed over to the duo of zombies staggering around the farthest truck. Though blood-soaked, they wore matching coveralls with a city crest on the shoulder. The soldiers pulled their knives to silently dispatch the creatures and then turned as two of the trucks roared to life. Oh yeah, got a full tank of gas right here, Johnson bellowed. Baker gave a thumbs up from the driver's seat of his. We're looking pretty good here too, Sarge. Okay, we know the mission, so let's get it done. Kersey raised his hand to round up his men, and the four left, split between the two trucks into teams of three. Chapter Eight Bill kept a slow pace, enough so that the zombies could keep up, and pulled the whistle again. Hey, Mason, he called. I think you can stop shooting. Our boys should be far enough away now that nobody else is going to break away. Yeah, you're probably right, the soldier replied, and ducked back inside the cab, sliding the door shut. So how much further do we have until we get to the bridge, he asked, as he took a seat beside the engineer. Should only be about five minutes or so, Bill replied, and offered his companion a smirk. Not too long, you in a hurry? Mason chuckled. Nah, just thought we might be able to get a nice breeze going off the river. Might help with the smell, that's for sure, Bill agreed. The private sighed as he watched the thousand or so zombies ambling after them, arms outstretched and bloody mouths open. So much wasted life out there, he mused. Don't know whether to cry or be pissed. I say neither, the engineer shrugged. Dwelling on it won't change it, and whoever is responsible for this is probably long dead. Mason's eyes darkened. At least they damn well better be. All you can do is keep moving forward, which is ironic given our current direction, Bill replied brightly. The private barked a laugh and shook his head. You're all right, Bill, he said, clapping his companion on the shoulder. Hey, you've only known me for a week, the engineer replied. Might want to reserve judgment on that one, he winked. The train rattled a little bit, signifying that they'd reached the bridge. As the cab backed into the bottleneck and zombies jostled and fought for position to follow, several of them toppled over the edge or were trampled, flailing bodies everywhere. Man, they really want us, don't they? Mason asked. Bill nodded. Yeah, I wouldn't worry, though. There's no way they're getting up here, he said. Even if they could climb, it's a hard time squeezing in between the train and the bridge railing. The vehicle screeched to a stop. So what now? Mason wondered. Bill grinned and reached up, pulling the whistle again, another wail echoing through the area. We keep drawing them in and hope our boys can get the job done. The soldier nodded and leaned back in his seat, putting his feet up. The duo relaxed and watched even more corpses stagger over the horizon, dumbly excited to try to eat a locomotive. Chapter Nine That does not look good, Baker said, as they headed down the last stretch of road towards the airport. Zombies staggered out from the side streets, ambling up onto the road towards the noise. No, it does not. Kowalski agreed, leaning forward to peer out the windshield of the large truck. 
Hopefully the airport isn't anywhere near as crowded. Even if it isn't, Baker replied, how much time are we going to have to get this thing moved? Kersey raised his binoculars. Drive to the end of the next street and stop, he instructed. What? Baker blurted. Those things are going to be on us in a matter of minutes if we do that. The sergeant motioned ahead. There's a dozen of them around the fire truck. Shit, the private muttered. Exactly, Kersey replied. Kowalski, I need you to pick some off from here so we can silently kill them when we move up. We start shooting at the fire truck. We're going to attract anything that might be at the airport. At least here, it might be out of earshot. Kowalski nodded. Let me slide by you, Sarge, he said, and ducked under his companion to switch seats. Just after Baker slammed on the brakes, he threw open the door and clambered up on top of the cab. He lowered himself to one knee and raised his rifle, steadying his breath to line up his first shot. The bullet ripped through his target's soft head, dropping the rest of the corpse to the ground. The crack of the gun echoed loudly, and the rest of the zombies hanging around the fire truck turned and headed slowly towards the dump. Kowalski kept himself steady and fired again and again, taking out each creature one by one. As he paused to reload, Baker unrolled the driver's side window. Kowalski, we gotta get rolling, man, he urged, motioning behind them. Kowalski glanced quickly, noting the large horde heading up behind them, looking to be in the hundred strong. 20 more seconds, he said, and fired more rapidly, barely taking the time to aim. His shots were true, however taking down as many as he could before diving back into the cab and slamming the door shut. Got him down to three, Sarge. Good job, Kersey replied. Let's go. Baker hit the gas, screaming towards the fire truck and putting at least 50 yards between them and the approaching horde. Stop here, the sergeant instructed, as they approached the trio of zombies still staggering up the tracks. When we're out, start getting into position to move that fire truck. I'm on it. Baker confirmed, and slammed on the brakes. The passengers leapt out and drew their machetes, jogging out of the way so the dump could scream by them. Go left, I got the right, Kersey said, and Kowalski nodded as the two branched out. The private slashed and took the first zombie's head off with a clean swing, whereas the sergeant stabbed directly into the forehead of his corpse. As both fell, Kersey motioned to the remaining zombie. Would you like the honors? Oh, please, Sarge, be my guest, Kowalski replied with a flourish. The sergeant jogged up and swung hard, catching the creature in the temple. It gave an almost surprised-sounding gurgle before it slumped to the ground. Do a sweep around the fire truck and make sure we don't have any surprises, Kersey instructed. Then I want you keeping an eye on that horde. Kowalski nodded. Yes, sir, he replied, and rushed around the overturned truck. He was thankful that there were no more zombies hanging around and unslung his rifle again to take stock of the airport. The wreckage from the plane was a couple hundred yards away, charred debris dotting the landscape. Black, corpse-shaped blobs were strewn everywhere, but none were moving. The hangars looked zombie-free as well. Hey, Sarge, we're good, he called over his shoulder. Doesn't look like anything is going on at the airport either. Kersey nodded. Good, keep an eye on the horde. If they get within a 100 yards, you shout. The private saluted him and jogged over to the road, taking a knee and looking through his scope to size up the situation. There was an overturned car on the side of the road that he estimated as his 100-yard marker. In the meantime, Kersey waved Baker in, inching him up to the bumper of the fire truck. He stopped him when the dump barely kissed the vehicle. Okay, you're looking good, he said taking a few steps back. When you hit the gas, floor it. Keep an eye on me, and I'll let you know if you need to lay off. Baker nodded and dropped gear, then punched the gas as hard as he could. The tires caught on the dirt and slammed into the overturned truck, whining and straining with every last ounce of horsepower. Hell yeah, keep it moving, Kersey cried, waving to the private to keep going as the fire truck began to slide off of the tracks. As the cab crossed over the first rail, however, it came to an abrupt stop, and he put his palms out, darting forward. What the fuck happened? Baker cried as he let off the gas. 
The sergeant shook his head. I don't know, hang tight, he replied, and laid down on the tracks to get a better view. He noticed on the side of the cab that was facing downwards, a hunk of one of the metal braces had broken free and wedged into the rail. Something metal is caught on the tracks, he called, and got up onto one knee. Baker muttered a curse under his breath and sighed. Ideas? Kersey thought for a moment, and then studied the lever on the side of the dump truck that allowed the back to rise and empty its contents. I've got an idea, but we're going to need some chain, he said. Sorry, Sarge, but I'm fresh out, Baker replied. Maybe in one of the hangars, the sergeant asked. Sarge, Kowalski shouted from the road. Whatever you're going to do, it's got to be in the next two minutes, because these boys are getting close. Kersey scrubbed his hands down his face. Fuck. He glanced back at the horde and skirted around to the passenger seat. Kowalski on me, he demanded, and the private followed him up into the cab. Thanks for taking bitch seat, Sarge, the private quipped. Kersey shook his head. Don't thank me yet, you haven't heard my plan. Fucking hell, Kowalski muttered. Where am I going, Sarge? Baker asked. Go up a couple more blocks, Kersey instructed, motioning away from the horde. Turn towards the interstate, then head back to the east. There was a two-story hotel by a roundabout a few blocks back. Baker shifted into reverse. Here's hoping they have a mini bar. He glanced in the rear view. Should I be getting them to follow us? Nope, that's Kowalski's job, Kersey replied. Sarge, I know I got a lot more ammo, but... The private in question trailed off. Don't worry, you'll be on the roof, the sergeant explained. And you get to spend the rest of the day picking off as many as you want. Not to mention you'll have the unit record for most kills in a day. Kowalski brightened. Really now? Okay, I'm in. Baker rumbled up the mostly empty street and sped towards the hotel parking lot. There was a burned out car upside down in front of the main entrance, and most of the windows on the ground floor of the scuzzy building were broken. Christ, Sarge, you couldn't have found me some better digs? Kowalski quipped. This looks like the kind of place that charges by the hour and comes with a dead hooker in every room. Kersey wrinkled his nose as he imagined a zombie hooker flopping about on a hotel bed. Good thing you don't have to go inside, huh? Kowalski barked a laugh and grabbed his ammo bag. He hung out the door and climbed up the side of the truck making an easy leap over onto the second floor railing. He leaned over as Kersey grabbed the door handle. You boys don't forget to pick me up now, he called. Baker offered a grin. Don't worry, sunshine, he yelled back. Wouldn't dream of missing out on weeks upon weeks of you bragging about the most kills in a day. As soon as you're in position, start shooting, Kersey said, as he shut the door, leaning out the window. Don't stop until we come back and stay tuned to Channel 8 on your radio. I'll let you know when we're headed your way. Kowalski saluted. Good luck, Sarge. He watched as the dump rumbled away, back in the same direction it had come. He turned his attention back to the main road and the flood of zombies flowing into the streets and parking lots nearby. He ran to the end of the exterior hallway to the maintenance room and kicked open the door. There was a ladder there that led up to the roof, and he burst inside, securing the door behind him. The roof was slightly slanted, but easy enough to navigate the metallic shingles. Kowalski took position at the top center, straddling the gentle peak and settling onto the rounded center. He wedged his ammo bag in front of him and unslung his rifle. Okay, who wants to go first? He asked and scanned the crowd. He focused on what looked like a bodybuilder, missing large chunks of muscled bicep, Sorry, bud, but you remind me of my high school bully. Here's a little payback. Kowalski pulled the trigger, and the zombie's head exploded in an array of crimson, splattering the corpses shambling around it. And there's one, the private said brightly. He took aim again, this time firing on a short blonde valley girl with milky dead eyes. Yeah, take that, Karen, he cried. He lowered his rifle and raised his eyes to the clouds, taking a moment of self-reflection. Yeah, I may have some lingering issues from my formative years, he said to himself, and then chuckled. Kowalski raised the rifle and fired again and again, 
the cracks drawing even more moans to the hotel. All right, Sarge, he said with a grin. I got him occupied. Do your thing. Chapter 10 Johnson studied the map of the south side of town, but was drawn out of his reverie at the thunk thunk of zombie flesh hitting the grill of the truck. Goddamn, Bretts, could you hold off on ramming these sons of bitches? He demanded, making it difficult to hold my train of thought. I mean, I could always lay on the horn, the corporal replied, but I don't think they're going to get out of the way. Johnson sighed and pointed out the windshield. When you get up to the next intersection, slow down so I can see where we are, he said. Zombies poured out of every opening, attracted to the rumbling of the dump. Brett's pulled up in front of the charred remains of a building, and the sounds of hands smacking against the sides of the truck intensified as they stopped. Johnson looked at the street sign, and then back to the map, lips pursed tightly. You know, it's okay to admit when you're lost, Brett's teased. The private growled. I know where we are, he snapped, and after another moment, finally tapped on the paper. There, found us. He grinned, leaning back in his seat, satisfied. Uh, the corporal began, raising an eyebrow. Are you going to share with me, or do I have to guess? Johnson shook his head as if to clear it. Oh, sorry, it's two more blocks up, then turn left. We should see the church after that. I think I can manage that, Bretz replied, and put the truck back into gear. He easily steamrolled over the hundreds of zombies surrounding them, parting the horde as they headed for the turn. The side street only had a handful of corpses milling about, but the church in the distance was surrounded by a horde of easily a hundred strong. That's gotta be it, Johnson pointed. Bretz pulled up to the side of the church, and as they approached, a pale arm hung a white flag out of one of the windows. Looks like they've been expecting us, the corporal said. He pulled closer and rolled down his own window, leaning out as if he were in the drive through A man in classic black pastor's clothes surveyed the soldiers. Well, it's not an arc, but I think given our current situation, that might be for the best. Especially when you consider old Johnson here gets seasick, Bretz replied. His passenger scoffed. It was one time. Well, I appreciate you boys coming, the pastor replied, putting a hand over his chest. I'm Pastor Dave. Good to meet you, Bretz replied. I'm Corporal Bretz, and this here is Private Johnson. Dave nodded to each of them. Pleasure to meet you, he said. Seth gave me a heads up that you boys were coming, so I got everyone moved into the rec center around back. It's got a flat roof, so I figured that would be easier than having people jump out of windows. Sounds good, the corporal replied. We'll meet you around back. He pulled away as Dave closed the window, and the truck rumbled around to the back, drowning out the excited moans. Man, these critters are hungry, Johnson said as they pulled up as close as they could to the side of the one-story building. Brett's slithered up into the driver's side window. Come on, let's get up there and help out, he said. They pulled themselves up onto the top of the truck, and a tall man in jeans and a polo shirt rushed over to the edge to give them a hand over. Be careful now, he said. That isn't a fall that you're gonna be coming back from. Appreciate the hand there, Bretz replied, as he jumped the gap. The man smiled and helped Johnson across as well. I'm George, the youth pastor here. Thank you, the corporal said, and introduced himself. Johnson did so as well, shaking the youth pastor's hand. So what's the deal here? Where's everybody at? George pointed at a hole in the far end of the roof, where a balding man reached down to pull a young woman up. They're still in the rec center, he explained. We have some elderly people in the group, so we thought it best to wait for you to get here before bringing them outside. Brett scratched the back of his head. Don't suppose you have some ladders we can use, do you? Yes, sir, we do. George said with a grin. We'll bring one up right now so we can start getting people loaded in. The corporal nodded. How many people are we looking at? 37, including myself, sir, the tall man replied. Okay, give me half a dozen able-bodied men to get down into the truck first, Bretz instructed. 
We're going to have a couple on the edge and the rest in the bed to help the less abled. Sounds good, George agreed. You wait here, and I'll get them rounded up and over to you. Johnson sighed as he stared down at the sea of hungry corpses below. Loading elderly people into a trash truck as an army of dead things bang on the side of it. Bratz couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, they left this one out of the recruitment brochure, didn't they? Several minutes later, they had four burly young men inside the back of the truck, with two more standing at the top of the ladder. Okay, let's start loading in some of the elderly, Brett said. He and Johnson stationed at the edge of the roof. George approached with a woman who looked to be in her mid-70s. Come on, Miss Mary, let's get you down there, he said gently. The soldiers helped her over to the men on top, and the ones in the bucket braced her as she climbed down. Christ, we're gonna be here for days, Johnson muttered under his breath. Brett shrugged. At least we're up here, nice and safe, he said. We could be dealing with that fire truck. Or we could be like Mason with our feet propped up on the train, listening to Bill tell stories. The private shot back. I mean, how does he keep getting that gig anyway? You should take it as a compliment, Bretz grinned. Just shows you that Sarge has a ton of faith in you. Johnson barked a laugh. Well, remind me to fuck something up next time I'm around him. All of a sudden, there was a metallic screech. What in the fuck? Johnson breathed, and the soldiers turned to see the back of the dump truck opening up, the front end rising. The people already inside scrambled to hold on to whatever they could, screaming. Oh my God, what's happening? George cried. Johnson let out a growl of frustration as he spotted the zombies hanging off of the release lever for the bucket. He pulled his rifle from his back and released the mag, making sure the chamber was empty. What are you doing? Brett snapped. One of them fuckers hit the lever, and we gotta hit it back, Johnson replied. You two are gonna lower me down as low as you can so I can hit it with my rifle. The corporal glanced at the fearful faces in the bucket as it raised even higher on its ascent. Fuck, let's do it, Brett said and motioned to George. Get his leg. Johnson laid down on his stomach, and they each took a leg, lowering him down over the side of the roof. Brett, if you drop me, I swear to Christ, I'm gonna haunt your ass. I might not if you weren't such a fat ass, Bretz grunted. In the back, the men were able to grip the sides of the truck, but one struggled to hold himself and keep hold of the elderly lady in his grasp. It's okay, Miss Mary whispered. He shook his head, his hand loosening on the side of the bucket. I'm so sorry. She wriggled out of his grip and slid down the bed towards the throng of hungry creatures. He watched in vain, able to solidify his grip now that he had the use of two hands. One of the young men closest to the bottom caught her to stop her descent, but her momentum caused him to lose his grip, and they both went tumbling into the horde. Miss Mary went head first into the asphalt, the zombies descending upon her immediately to snuff out her screams. The young man cried out in disappointment and fear as he kicked off of the shoulders of a corpse to try to scramble back into the rising bucket. He almost managed to get a fresh grip on the metal, but shrieked in pain as teeth tore into his calf. His screams and pleas for help spurred Johnson on, the soldier desperately stabbing at the lever with his rifle. A zombie grasped hold of the butt of it, and they began a vertical tug of war. Let go, motherfucker, Johnson yelled, and pulled out his handgun with his free hand, firing into the zombie's face. The creature's grip went slack, and Johnson stabbed once more, finally catching the lever. The gear shifted pace, and the door began to close, the bucket returning back to its prone position. A few men joined George and Bretts in hauling the soldier back up onto the roof, and he flopped over onto his back in a sweaty heap. Holy shit, that sucked, he huffed. Bretts clapped him on the shoulder. Could be worse, you could have been on my end. You're going on a fucking diet, that's an order. Johnson gave him a playful salute while he caught his breath. Screams arose inside of the truck, and the corporal joined George at the edge of the roof to watch in helpless horror as the door came down on the young man whose legs were being feasted on below. The life drained from his eyes as the door severed his thighs.
and Brett's took aim. Everybody stay back and cover your ears, he said, and the other civilians in the truck complied, turning their faces away as well. He fired once, putting a bullet into the back of the young man's head. Why did you do that? George cried, grabbing his arm. Brett shook him off. If I didn't, then he would have become one of them, and we've lost enough lives today. Johnson got to his feet. We're gonna have to keep a watch, make sure they don't hit the lever again. Won't be an issue, Bretz replied, and took aim again, firing a single shot that severed the lever directly from the truck with a metallic cling. That should do the trick. Even so, keep an eye on it. Johnson nodded and reloaded his gun, slinging it back over his shoulder. If it means I don't have to be dangled over them like a fish at one of them SeaWorld shows, I'm all about it. Bretz pulled out his walkie-talkie and moved out of the way as they began to move people across into the truck again. Mason, come in, the corporal said. There was a quick crackle and a click. Mason here. You boys getting along okay? Bretz asked. Yes, sir. Just watching zombies tumble down the embankment into the river, came the reply. The corporal rolled his eyes. Sounds like you're working hard. Always, sir. Mason replied easily. Mission update, Bretz continued. We're at the church getting people loaded into the truck. At the pace we're going, we should be headed your way within the hour. We'll be waiting and ready for you, sir, the private said. Brett straightened. Have you heard from Sarge? Yes, sir. They had some complications on their first run, but they're gearing up for another go at it, came the reply. The corporal sighed and nodded. Okay, I'll contact you when we're loaded up. If we need to delay transport so we're on their timeline, let me know. There was a moment of static before another click, and Mason declared, Yes, sir, we'll see you soon. Chapter 11 Baker spat across the tarmac. That hangar looks like our best bet, Kersey said pointing to one with an open door and a half-dismantled plane inside. Baker eased to the right, scoping out their target as he drove. Yep, looks like maintenance. He slowed a little to avoid a hunk of metal from the crashed airplane. Not saying I'd wish that fate on anybody, but given the way this town ended up, they probably got off easy. He inclined his head to the charred corpses everywhere, some still strapped into their seats. That may be true. Kersey said thoughtfully, but I'd much prefer to go down fighting. I like the thought of taking some of those things out with me if I have to go. Baker snorted. I'll remember that the next time we're in a dead-end situation. He slowed to a crawl and stopped about 15 feet from the hangar door and killed the engine. Okay, no shots unless absolutely necessary, the sergeant said as he drew his machete. Let's find some chain, secure it to the back, and get out. His companion nodded. Lead the way. As they walked to the open door, they heard the crack of gunfire in the distance. Sounds like Kowalski is still having a good time, Kersey said, shaking his head. Baker grinned. He really wants those bragging rights, doesn't he? Just doing what I can to keep him motivated, the sergeant admitted, and they entered the hangar. They scanned the large space and didn't see anything moving in their immediate area, but there were several shadows and dark corners. Kersey reached over and smacked the handle of the machete against a metal table, sending a loud clang echoing through the space. There were no answering moans, but there was definitely sounds of movement coming from one of the offices to the left. You get the chain, I'll check it out, he said, and after Baker's nod, headed over to the office. It had a giant bay window as one wall, and he cringed at the sight inside. There was an overturned desk along the far wall, pinning a pissed-off-looking zombie behind it from the waist down. Next to the desk sat a corpse in coveralls, a large chunk of his face missing, a double-barreled shotgun sitting in his lap. Kersey shook his head, not envying the series of events that had likely led to the moment this man decided to take his life. He noticed a large box of shells next to the limp man and drew his bottom lip between his teeth in deliberation. Couldn't hurt to have a little more firepower, he muttered, and slipped into the office, careful to stay out of reach of the pinned zombie. 
He grabbed the shotgun and the shells, securing them to his belt, and then vacated the area quickly. Found some chain? He asked as he approached Baker. The private stood over a workbench, with a whole mess of industrial tools scattered across it. Yeah, there's a whole mess of it over there. We'll grab it and let's get going, the sergeant urged. Baker crossed his arms and turned to his superior. I was thinking, Sarge, he began. I don't know if it's going to be enough to just hook the chain up to the center of the truck back. Too much of a risk it's going to snap under the weight. You got a better idea? Kersey raised an eyebrow. Baker wrapped his hand around a giant drill and held it up, the thick bit glimmering as he tilted it. Give me 20 minutes and let me drill a few more holes through the hull, he suggested. Then we can hook up several chains and distribute the weight evenly. I like it, the sergeant agreed with a nod and held up the shotgun he'd found. And while you do that, I'm going to make this a little more dangerous. As Baker headed off with the drill, Kersey moved over to a large metal saw. It was battery powered, and he fired it up, laying the shotgun barrel down to line up his cut. The saw went through it like butter, and he held up his brand new sawed off shotgun, blowing gently on the cut tip. A half an hour later, the soldiers ran the last of the chain through the holes on either side of the center hitch. Baker attached large hooks to the ends that they could use to affix to the fire truck. Well, what do you think? Kersey asked, as he took a step back from their handiwork. Baker grinned as he piled the excess chain into the back. I think that's as good as it's going to get. All right, let's do it, the sergeant said, and they clambered back into the cab. As they approached the fire truck, they rumbled through a pothole, sending the chains clanking against the metal frame. A dozen or so zombies staggered out of a nearby broken down store, and Baker shook his head. Shit, that woke some of them up. How much time do you need to hook up the chains? Kersey asked. Five minutes, Max, the private replied. The sergeant checked his assault rifle and put his hand on the door handle to get ready to jump out. You get that truck moved, I'll handle them, he said. Baker nodded as he hit the brakes. Yes, sir. Kersey threw open the door and jogged to the center of the street, heading away from the trucks and the other direction of the pack of corpses. He waited until he was at least 20 yards away from Baker, before taking aim and firing. I'm over here, boys, come and get me, he yelled as he dropped two zombies in quick succession. He continued to walk backwards, drawing the group of rotted flesh away from the trucks, brow furrowing as more zombies came out of the woodwork and staggered up onto the road between him and Baker. Well, this isn't good, he muttered, and jogged down into the ditch, into a vacant parking lot in the direction of the airport. He turned around again and continued to fire, dropping more corpses to get trampled by the growing horde in pursuit of him. His rifle gave a dull click as the zombies matched his pace, about 10 yards away from him, and he pulled out his new shotgun, firing a spray of metal pellets. The blast sent bits of gooey flesh and bone flying, tripping up a few of the horde. The metallic grinding of metal on metal echoed in the distance, and he glanced over at the trucks to see the back of the dump lifting up. Fucking hell, he cursed, as he noticed some stragglers heading in that direction. Baker, you'd better be back in that truck. He broke into a sprint, angling himself so he could skirt around the pursuing corpses. He managed to get a bit of distance before reloading his rifle and firing at the zombies heading for the trucks. He paused to line up a shot on one of them, but its head exploded before he could fire. Baker gave him a thumbs up from the front of the dump before clambering up into the driver's seat. Kersey took off in the direction of the airport, hitting the runway and pounding pavement towards the wreckage, moving parallel along the train tracks. The piercing screech of metal on metal as Baker floored it in reverse caused a good chunk of the horde to switch gears, but with the private safely in the truck, Kersey focused on his own safety. He continued to fire and run, fire and run, and then checked back on the trucks through his scope. What the fuck are you doing? He murmured when he realized that Baker was pulling the fire truck this time. The screeching was near deafening, even from so far away, but then he realized it was actually working. Except the noise had drawn the entire horde. 
Chapter 12 Oh no you don't, Kersey roared, and fired with the shotgun some more. But the metallic squeals drowned him out. He once again sprinted around the horde, back up the tracks towards the trucks, hoping to beat them there. He threw his rifle over his shoulder and pumped his arms as well as his legs, heart leaping as the fire truck cleared the tracks. Baker jumped out and hit the lever to lower the door, and then looked up at his sergeant with easily a hundred zombies in close pursuit. Get the chains, Kersey screamed. Baker got to work unhooking the fire truck, and the sergeant reached him, huffing as he struggled to undo a chain that had gotten crushed by the twisting metal frame. That worked better than expected, the private said brightly, unhooking three of the five chains. Kersey shook his head. Let's avoid getting eaten before you make that proclamation, he said, still struggling to get it free. Baker grasped the other one on his side, finding the same problem, that the chain was completely stuck in the busted fire truck. He looked up at the approaching horde, only about 15 yards away. We're not going to make it, Sarge, he warned, eyes widening. Kersey looked over his shoulder and grunted, kicking the fire truck in frustration. Fuck. He shook his head and ducked under the chain to get to Baker's side. Head towards the hotel, now. They took off down the road a bit, before turning north onto a side street, skidding around the corner at the sight of more corpses in the middle of the road. Two zombies staggered out of the open door of a house to the right, tumbling ass over tea kettle as they tried to navigate the stairs, and Kersey shoved Baker in that direction. They swept past the tangled creatures and thundered up the front steps, hurtling inside and slamming the door behind them. The soldiers dropped to the floor and pressed their backs up against the wall, staying out of sight and silent as possible. The moans and groans outside seemed to be moving past them, as opposed to circling the house. But there was a shuffling echo from the living room. Kersey looked over at his companion, putting a finger to his lips. Baker nodded, and the sergeant drew his machete, heading silently down the hall. He jumped into the room, prepared to strike high. But the zombie was short and dove for his midsection. He thrust down into the top of her head, leaping back, her face bouncing harmlessly off of his torso that she'd wanted to devour just a millisecond before. He tore the machete from the teenaged corpse's head and let out a deep sigh of relief over having narrowly escaped death once again. Baker entered the room, shoulders a little more relaxed. The bulk of the hordes passed the house now, he said. You okay, Sarge? Heart's going like it's keeping the beat at a rave, but other than that, I'm good. Kersey replied. Baker nodded. I think if we give it five minutes or so, we should be able to sneak out and get back to the truck. The sergeant shook his head. I don't think that's going to work, he said, crossing his arms. I don't know what you did, but that hook on the chain I was working on is completely embedded into the frame. It's going to take a fucking torch to get that off. So how are we getting Kowalski? The private demanded. Maybe Bretts and Johnson can get him before heading to the train? Kersey asked, as he pulled out his walkie-talkie. Mason, come in. The response was near immediate. Mason here, Sarge. What's the status on Johnson and Bretts? Kersey asked. We're fine, Sarge, thanks for asking, Bretts replied. All done. Kersey sighed. Fuck. I'm going to assume that wasn't in regards to our safety? The corporal joked. Sorry, the sergeant replied. We have a bit of a situation here and could have used your truck. Bretts came back. Sarge, if you need us to, we can go get another one. Baker waved the sergeant over to the window. Hang on, I think Baker has an idea, Kersey said, and lowered the radio to go have a look. What have you got? There's a Humvee at the house across the street, the private said. Should be good enough to get us through the crowd. He motioned through the curtains at the bright yellow Humvee proudly displayed in the driveway across the way. You think you can hotwire it? Kersey asked. Baker grinned. Might kill the resale value, but yeah, I can do it. Bretts, the sergeant said into the radio. Getting another truck isn't going to be necessary. The corporal let out a sigh of relief. Good to hear that, because we really don't want to run from these fuckers any more than we already have today. You and me both, brother. 
Kersey replied. Mason, can you put Bill on? There was a pause before the engineer said, What can I do for you, Sergeant? How long do you think it would take you to get to the airport? Kersey asked. We can be there in 15 minutes. Okay, you boys get ready to move and wait for our signal, the sergeant instructed. We might not have much of a window to hop a ride. 10-4, I'll be ready, Bill replied. Kersey turned the dial to channel eight and raised the radio once again. Kowalski, you still having fun? Yet another gunshot echoed in the distance, and then there was a click. Absolutely, Sarge, the private replied. I've taken out a few hundred of these boys. This record is going to stand until the end of the war. I'm glad you're excited, Kersey said, smiling. I'll need you to change gears a bit, though. You on your way to come get me? Yeah, but there's been a change in plan, the sergeant said, taking a deep breath. We're going to need you to find a way down off the roof so we can pick you up at ground level. There was a long pause. There were a few clicks, as if he were starting to speak and then thought better of it. I'm sorry, Sarge, Kowalski finally said. Can you repeat that? My radio had the bullshit filter turned on. No, you heard me correctly, Kersey declared. Are you fucking kidding me? The private cried. I've spent the last hour attracting every zombie in the city to me, and currently have half the goddamn population of this shitberg surrounding me. And you want me to get down to the ground? What the fuck happened to the dump truck? Kersey gave him a moment to calm down, and then replied, it's permanently fused to the fire truck. Just, Kowalski stammered, anger clear in his tone. Fine, God damn it! give me a minute. I don't think he's happy, Baker quipped. Kersey shook his head. Yeah, whenever we stop next, we'll have to raid a trophy shop and make him an award for his daily kill record. I'll add it to the shopping list, the private laughed. Sarge, I just checked the way I came up, and the room is filled with zombies. Kowalski came back. Even if I could get by them, the entire upper floor is clogged with those things. So unless you want me to go full frat boy and jump into the pool, I don't know how I'm pulling this off. The soldier shared a sly glance. Kersey raised the radio to his mouth. A pool, you say? Where's it located? Sarge, we need to work on your sarcasm detection, Kowalski snapped. Well, if you didn't want to do it, then you shouldn't have suggested it. The sergeant shot back. Didn't you learn anything from the Istanbul mission? Now where's the pool? God damn it, Kowalski growled in defeat. It's in the back of the hotel. Kersey cocked his head. Are there many zombies around it? A couple dozen, but it's gated, so I'll have a safe landing zone. Okay, you get ready to move, the sergeant instructed. Baker and I have to jack a ride, and then we'll be over. Kowalski sighed audibly. Fine. I'm shooting a couple more zombies just on principle before you get here. Chapter 13 How are we looking? Kersey asked, as he joined Baker at the front door. The private peered through the curtain. Still about half a dozen, but nothing we can't handle. How long to hotwire it? The sergeant asked. Baker shrugged. Two, three minutes max? Okay. Kersey said with a nod. You make a beeline to the vehicle. I'm on zombie duty. He pulled out his machete, gripping it tightly. Gonna be as quiet as I can be. They took up positions on either side of the door and shared a look before the sergeant threw the door open. Baker sprinted across the street, drawing the attention of the six shambling zombies, and they turned to follow him, moaning with excitement. Kersey leapt quietly down the steps coming up behind them, executing a surprise attack. He brought the weapon down hard on the back of the first one's head, caving in the skull. He immediately spun and thrust, catching the next one in the side of the face with the blade. And as they both crumbled to the ground, Baker reached the Humvee. Kersey slashed at a third zombie, but the echoes of more moaning rode to him on the breeze, and he turned to see a good portion of their old pursuers heading back towards them up the street. So much for stealth, he muttered and pulled out his handgun. He rapidly dropped the last three zombies still heading for Baker, who popped his head out of the vehicle in surprise. I got it under control, the sergeant yelled. Keep working. Baker ducked back into the vehicle as Kersey brandished his assault rifle, 
firing into the oncoming fleet. He dropped as many as he could in the front, sending them stumbling over their fallen brethren as he reloaded. How we looking, he yelled. Baker stuck his hand out the door, keeping his head under the dash. 30 seconds, he shouted back. Kersey ran up next to the passenger door, firing again to try to trip up more of the staggering dead. The gap rapidly closed, and when the horde was about 20 yards away, the vehicle roared to life. Got it, let's go, Baker cried, and jumped up into the driver's seat. Kersey dove inside, and the private reversed and then floored it, sending corpses flying in every direction as he barreled up the street. Man, I miss this kind of power behind the wheel, Baker groaned, as the vehicle mowed through the zombies like they weren't even there. Kersey chuckled. Thank God for overcompensating civilians, he replied, and raised the radio to his lips. Mason, tell Bill to hit it. Copy that, Mason replied. Kersey switched back to channel eight. Kowalski, we're on the way. Be there in 60 seconds. You ready? Click. No. That's the spirit, the sergeant replied brightly. We'll cover you. Damn well better, the private muttered back. Baker drove around the corner and onto the main road leading to the hotel. There were easily a thousand zombies stretched along the street, swarming the parking lot and the building proper. He wasn't kidding about his kill record, was he? Baker asked breathlessly, at the sight of unmoving bodies piled up in big stacks amongst the still walking ones. Kersey shook his head. I've known him for years, and he takes those very seriously. Got super pissed when Johnson took his record in Iraq. He looked up towards the roof and spotted the private running across it. I see him, he's on the move. Baker floored it, skidding around the corner and slamming zombies out of the way as they circled the building. There were a few dozen creatures hanging out around the pool gate, and he skidded to a stop as close to the latch as possible. Kowalski came flying down from the roof, splashing into the deep end, and Kersey popped up out of the sunroof, opening fire on the zombies clustered near the door. As they fell, Kowalski hauled himself out of the water, limping a little as he made his way to the gate. I got you, just head towards us, Kersey yelled, and continued firing, picking off any corpse that even looked in the direction of the path the private needed to take. Kowalski unlatched the gate and hobbled to the Humvee, throwing open the back door to fall inside in a dripping heap. I'm in, go, go, go. Kersey slid back into his seat, just as Baker hit the gas the force of them peeling out, closing the back door behind their refugee. Holy shit, that was epic, Baker blurted, as he hit the main road, glancing at his companion sprawled out across the back seat. You okay? Fucking banged up my leg on the bottom of the pool, Kowalski groaned. Goddamn safety regulations keeping everything shallow. Let a few kids drown, I needed the deep end. Well, if it's any consolation, that was without a doubt a 9.8 on the dive. Kersey piped up. 9.8, the private cried. What in the hell do I have to do to get a 10? Probably not come up injured, Baker asked. Kowalski let out an exasperated laugh, just happy to be alive. Yeah, I'll buy that. Chapter 14 How bad's your ankle? Kersey asked, as he and Kowalski stood next to the train tracks. They'd driven a good mile from the airport, leaving the horde far behind. The train slowly made its way towards them, a veritable army of creatures behind it. Eh, just sprained it pretty good, Kowalski replied. Nothing a day or two off of it won't cure. The sergeant nodded. Lucky for you, we have some downtime in our future. No way in hell we're tackling Spokane without some major backup. Did the general tell you how many troops he's sending us? Kowalski asked. Kersey scratched the back of his head. Yeah, he did, but you've had a rough enough day already. I don't want to depress you with specifics. Oh, great, so nowhere near enough to get the job done safely, the private moaned. The sergeant stretched his arms above his head. Don't you just love being bright enough to read between the lines? Oh, yeah, it's joy, all right, Kowalski replied. So how high did you get your kill streak? Kersey asked. Day's not over yet. The private smirked, but at the moment I topped out at 283. His superior's eyes widened. 
Damn, man, that's gonna be a tough number to beat going forward. Thanks, Sarge. Kowalski puffed out his chest with pride. Feels good to be back on top again. Kersey chuckled. Johnson leaving Iraq with the title eats you up, doesn't it? Man, I still call bullshit on that, the private scowled. Calling in an airstrike shouldn't count. The sergeant cocked his head. Well, if you want to play it that way, then the remote drone pilot should get credit, right? Well, all I care about is the record is now mine, Kowalski replied, clenching a victorious fist. Kersey's walkie-talkie crackled to life. Hey, Sarge, you there? Bretz asked. Kersey raised the mouthpiece to his lips. Yep, I'm here, what's up? Got us a bit of a following here, and Bill doesn't think it's a good idea for us to stop. The corporal replied. I mean, unless you want to fight off a couple thousand of those things. The sergeant pursed his lips. Not really at the top of my list of things to do today. I didn't think so, Bretz replied. So how do you boys feel about hopping a moving train? Kersey took a deep breath. How fast are we talking? Not very, just enough to keep pace ahead of the zombies, Brett said. The sergeant looked over at his limping companion. Think you can make it? I've run through worse, Kowalski replied. But I am going to complain about it. Kersey barked a laugh. I don't doubt it. He raised the walkie-talkie to his mouth. Yeah, Bretts, we'll be good to go. All right, we'll be on your position in about a minute, the corporal confirmed. Kersey turned to the Humvee. Baker, time to go. The private emerged from the vehicle, arming the switch on the C4 he'd rigged up inside. He jogged over to the duo, holding the detonator above his head. You ready to blow up that behemoth? Kowalski asked. Baker grinned. There's enough C4 in there to get it into orbit. Think it's going to actually attract those things? The sniper wondered. Well, since we have quite the following already, I was going to wait until we're up the line a bit before triggering it, Baker explained. Maybe get lucky and get a second wave following us. Kersey nodded. Not a bad idea. The train closed in, moving at only a few miles an hour. A sea of zombies lumbered behind, with only a few feet of space between. All right, here's our ride, the sergeant said. Kowalski, you're up first. He clapped his limping friend on the back. Kowalski hobbled along the rail, looking back as he moved, for the ladder to catch up to him for the engine car. He grabbed it and hauled himself up with his arms, Kersey and Baker jogging behind him. He slipped into the engine car, and Baker leapt up next, quickly sliding out of the way so Kersey could jump up with relative ease. All aboard and ready to get rolling, the sergeant declared as he entered the cramped engine cab. Well, get comfy, the engineer bellowed from the console. We have a long ride ahead of us. I'm gonna keep it about this speed for an hour or so to make sure we're deep in the woods with these guys behind us. Baker set his watch for 20 minutes. Okay, my timer is set to detonate the Humvee, which will hopefully give us a second group. Did anybody think to bring beer? Johnson raised his hand. I wish. Kowalski cut in as he lowered himself to a sitting position on the floor. It would be nice to have my daily kill record celebrated properly. What are you talking about? Johnson's eyes narrowed. You know I have the squad record. Kowalski grinned up at his comrade. Not anymore, got 283 today. Johnson paled and scrubbed his hands down his face. I'm never going to hear the end of this, am I? The sniper crossed his arms. Did you let me hear the end of it after your little airstrike? Well, no, his companion stammered. But that was totally different. How? Well, I mean, it was my record, Johnson said, looking ever the petulant child. So it was different. The group burst into laughter, even the two arguing soldiers, partly because of the argument, but also just in relief at surviving the day. Chapter 15 Kowalski muttered a few choice obscenities under his breath and ducked back inside the engine car. Sarge, we've got a problem. Let me guess, they aren't breaking away? Kersey sighed. I watched them for five solid minutes, and maybe a half dozen broke off from the pack. 
the sniper explained. Even if we leave them in the dust, there's a good chance they're just gonna follow us down the tracks. We have enough ammo to take them out, though, Mason piped up. Why don't we just set up a firing line and start taking them down? Brett shook his head. Because we don't know what's ahead of us, we can't burn that much ammo. Maybe get a couple decoys, Kersey asked. Fan out into the woods and draw them in? Johnson crossed his arms. Sarge, that's all kinds of risky. Doesn't look like there are any sorts of paths in the woods out there. Gonna be way too easy to get tripped up. I still have a couple blocks of C4, Baker cut in. We can get ahead of them a bit. I can run out and plant some and get back to the train before they get close. Kersey cocked his head. How much do you have left? Three blocks, Baker replied, as Bill increased the accelerator behind him. The sergeant nodded. That's not a bad idea, but I just hate the idea of using it. He paused when he realized they were moving faster. Bill, why did you accelerate? We're not doing Baker's plan. Bill clucked his tongue. You want to clear out those zombies, right? That's what we're discussing, Kersey said. The engineer waved him off. Then hang tight and I'll take care of it. The train picked up speed, putting several hundred yards between the boxcar and the ambling horde. Bill rode the momentum all the way up a half mile incline before screeching to a halt at the top. He triggered the emergency brakes and pulled a crowbar from under the console whistling as he headed to the door. Pardon me, boys, he said, and Mason and Baker glanced at Kersey. The sergeant nodded his approval, and the soldiers opened the door, getting out and sweeping the immediate area as Bill jumped down. The rest of the group followed, curiously watching as the engineer stretched his arms above his head, bouncing on the balls of his feet for a moment, before strolling down the train towards the boxcar. The soldiers followed, and at the second to last car, he hopped up onto the back and began to fiddle with the coupler. He paused and stuck his head out to survey the group. Hey, Sergeant, he said. You boys don't need anything in the box car, do you? Kersey glanced around at his men. Everything we need is in the front couple of cars, right? There were nods all around, and he turned back to Bill. Yeah, we're good. Fantastic, the engineer replied brightly and then disappeared back between the cars. He pulled the pin on the coupler and stood up, giving the hitch a few good stomps with his foot. Gravity began to take hold, and the free-roaming boxcar began to roll slowly away from the train taken by the hill. It picked up speed and sliced right into the decomposing flesh of the oncoming horde like butter. Zombies parted like the Red Sea, leaving crimson tracks behind thousands of mutilated zombies flying everywhere. The car whizzed out of sight on the horizon, and a mere hundred corpses remained, many missing limbs. Johnson turned to Bill and began a slow clap, his mouth agape in awe. The engineer still stood atop the coupler and gave a playful bow as the rest of the soldiers joined in the applause. Well, Johnson said as he clapped Kowalski on the back, Looks like your daily record lasted all of an hour. The private's eyes widened. Son of a bitch. What do you think there, Sarge? Johnson teased. Call that an even thousand? Kersey chuckled. Unless you want to go count the body parts. Yeah, I think a thousand sounds good, the private replied. Kowalski began stomp hobbling back towards the engine car, muttering under his breath. You just wait until I get more ammo. Does this mean I'm officially part of the squad? Bill asked as he jumped down to the ground. Johnson grinned. Brother, you just killed a thousand zombies with a boxcar. You're one of us without a doubt. Glad to be part of the team, the engineer declared, holding up his crowbar with triumph. Mason shook his head as they wandered after Kowalski. I can't believe one train car did that much damage. It's 32 tons of rolling steel, Bill explained. It probably hit them going 40, 45 miles an hour. Nothing organic is going to react real well to that kind of impact. Baker raised an eyebrow. Do we need to go get it? Nah, it'll be fine, the engineer said, waving flippantly behind him. 
It'll just keep going until it runs out of steam. Sergeant, you'll just have to let the next team coming up know about it. They can latch it to the front of their engine and bring it back. Kersey nodded. I can handle that. Plus, the general will get a kick out of that story. I have to admit, that was pretty fucking awesome. So what do you say? Bill cracked his knuckles. Should we keep on trucking and find us a nice place to stay for the night? The soldiers let out collective noises of appreciation and clambered back up into the engine car. Kersey looked back at the remaining survivors on the blood-soaked tracks, aimlessly staggering to their feet in disoriented arcs, mostly dispersing into the woods. He let out a deep breath, finally feeling like they'd completed their mission. Chapter 16 The train coasted along at a comfortable five miles an hour, within view of the Lake Pond Oreille at the northern tip of Idaho. The soldiers took in the sight of the setting sun glinting over the water, sparkling away, and almost feeling like the town of Hope was a fitting name. This is one hell of a sight, Johnson breathed. I can see why people decided to settle here. Let's be honest, Kowalski said. The only reason anybody settled these parts is because their wagons broke down and they didn't have the ability to keep moving. Let's come back here in another month or so and see if you like it with 10 feet of snow on the ground. Johnson grinned. I don't know, I could go for some sledding. Hey, Sarge, Bill piped up. Looks like there are some buildings up ahead. Want me to stop? Kersey turned to the engineer. How close are we to Spokane? Best guess is about 90 miles, but it's not going to be too much longer before we start hitting real patches of civilization, Bill replied. The sergeant nodded. That's all I needed to hear, he replied, and raised his hands. See if you can't find us someplace nice. You got it. The engineer turned back to the console and began to slow down. Kowalski hung out the door and raised his rifle, scanning the area. Doesn't look like there's anything moving up there, he said. And unless my eyes are playing tricks on me, looks like there is a nice lakefront resort in our future. God knows we've earned it, Bretts added. The soldiers all checked their weapons, readying themselves for one more sweep once the train stopped. Bill screeched the vehicle to a halt, right in front of the three-story resort. A billboard facing the tracks boasted, Hope Full Service Resort. I guess it would be too much to hope that the masseuses are still around, Baker joked. Yeah, you're gonna have to take care of that happy ending all by yourself, Kowalski quipped and then raised his hand. On that note, I call not bunking with Baker. Bratz and Johnson hit the ground first doing a quick sweep of the immediate area as the rest of the soldiers leapt down, save Kowalski, who carefully climbed. Bill walked to the door and sat down, letting his legs dangle over the edge. Yeah, yeah, I know the drill, he declared. Just make sure y'all don't forget me once you clear the place. Kowalski snorted. Don't worry, Mr. Record Holder, we won't forget you. Kersey led the group across the parking lot, everyone at high alert. There was no movement anywhere, not even a single car parked there. They reached the front doors, and he motioned for Johnson to deal with the lock. The private knelt in front of the lock with his picking tools and fiddled with it for a moment before stopping and leaning back on his haunches. What's the problem? Kersey asked. He shook his head and opened the door that had been unlocked all along. Gotta love small towns. He held it open with a flourish waving his teammates inside. The front lobby was massive, a huge open concept with a hunting theme. Animal heads dotted the walls, various fur skins lining all of the furniture. The soldiers fanned out, surprised not only to find no zombies, but no signs of any struggle whatsoever. This is a hell of a nice place, Mason said. Kowalski poked a stuffed bear head with the barrel of his gun. As long as you're not a member of PETA. Johnson moved into a room off to the side, and then emerged almost immediately, a huge grin on his face. It's clear in here, and there's a restaurant with a full bar. Hallelujah, Baker exclaimed. Kersey flopped down on a cowskin couch in the lobby and put his feet up. 
Brett, can you go get Bill? I think we're in good shape here. The corporal nodded and headed back outside to collect the engineer. Johnson, Baker, Mason, I want you to do a sweep of the rooms. Make sure every inch of this place is zombie free, Kersey said, and the three soldiers nodded, heading up the stairs quickly. The sergeant rubbed his hand down the black and white upholstery. Little odd for my tastes, but if it works for you, have at it, he muttered, shaking his head. He raised his walkie-talkie to his mouth. Heartland Base, please respond. This is Sergeant Kersey. There was a pause. This is Heartland Base. We read you loud and clear, Sergeant Kersey. I have a priority alpha message for General Stevens, he said, and then waited while the operator informed him they would get him the general. He wrinkled his nose, more than a little creeped out by all the decapitated animal heads staring at him. He avoided the gaze of a snarling wolf. Sergeant, please tell me you have good news. Stevens came through the radio. Yes, sir. We have cleared the path through Missoula and are currently in Hope, Idaho, Kersey explained. 90 miles from Spokane. How much further are you going to be able to push on? Stevens asked. Kersey took a deep breath. Realistically, General, this is as far as we can go without significant backup, he admitted. We're going to be hitting civilization soon, and we can't risk compromising our current position. It's a good staging area for the Spokane assault, he paused. How soon can we expect our reinforcements? I don't have a specific timeline for you, the general admitted. But three, maybe four days for the train convoy to reach you. The sergeant let out a deep sigh of relief. There's no rush on our part, he assured him. We're all beyond exhausted and could use an opportunity to rest up. Oh, and when the convoy gets going, they need to contact us. There are a few things they'll need to be aware of on their trip up. I have to say, Sergeant, Stevens began, you have exceeded any and all expectations I had for this mission, the speed at which you completed it, and all without a single casualty among your men. You should be very proud. Kersey smiled. I am, and I appreciate the compliment. Kersey, I need you to be frank with me. The sergeant leaned forward, brow furrowing. Yes, sir? Do you feel like you are up to the task of leading the assault on Spokane? Stevens asked. Kersey blinked at the mouthpiece for a moment before responding. You want me to be in command of a thousand men? Not just be in command, the general amended, but draw up and lead the operation. The sergeant flopped back against the couch, mouth agape. I, with all due respect, that sounds like a huge step up. I'll be blunt, Stevens said immediately. This virus hit our command structure hard. We've lost well over half of our leadership, and some of those who are still in charge aren't equipped to deal with this new type of battle we're waging. You have proven yourself more than capable in combating the enemy, and if you feel as though you're up to the task, I will give you the opportunity. Kersey drew in a deep breath. Yes, sir, I can handle it and won't let you down. At this time, I'm giving you a field promotion to captain, Stevens declared. In a few days' time, you will have the command of a thousand troops for the assault on Spokane. Thank you, thank you, General, Kersey stammered, still stunned. Don't let me down, Captain, Stevens replied. The new captain sat up ramrod straight and nodded. I won't, sir. He stared at the walkie-talkie in his hands, long after it went silent, stock still on the hideous couch until the trio thundered back down from upstairs. Hey, Sarge, we're all clear here, Johnson bellowed. Everyone's gonna get their own room, too. They approached the stunned soldier, who didn't move or acknowledge their presence. Sarge, Mason asked, as Brett's returned with Bill in tow. You okay? Huh? Kersey snapped out of his reverie and shook his head, setting down the radio. Yeah, sorry, the general just threw me for a loop. Brett's approached, brow furrowed. What's going on, Sarge? Well, for starters, it's now Captain, Kersey said, and his men erupted into applause. He scratched the back of his head as they hooted, and then put his hands up to calm them down. It also means that I'm in charge of the assault on Spokane. The corporal saluted him. Sir, I think I speak for everyone here when I say we're behind you. 
We couldn't be happier about following you into battle. Another round of whoops and hoots. So, Captain, Kowalski said with a grin, what's your first order as a newly promoted man? Kersey finally relaxed, leaning back and curling his hands behind his head. I think we've been through enough today, and we have more than enough on our plate for tomorrow, he said. For tonight, my orders are to secure the building, find something in that kitchen to whip up, and unlike the last bar we were at, tonight it's a two-drink minimum. The squad blew up into even louder cheers, hauling their new captain from the couch to hustle him into the restaurant proper. It would be a celebration for them all, a minor reprieve from the hell they'd be facing soon enough. For that night, however, they had each other, and they had safety and relaxation, and they were going to make the most of it by carrying out their new captain's orders. End of Book 5 The Battle of Spokane is on the horizon, but first the action shifts to Nevada as a caravan makes its way to a group of survivors.